I wanted to clear up a misconception about why Stockton rushed used carbon fiber for the hull of the Ocean Gate Titan to go over a little bit about the one-third scale hull testing and how he derived the real-time monitoring system. He didn't just pull these things out of thin air. The general consensus is that Rush was a cheap penny pincher, and that's simply not the case here. The real reason why he used carbon fiber is because of the strength to buoyancy ratio, not the cost. Concerning strength to buoyancy, Rush claimed that carbon fiber is three times better than the next best thing, titanium. Carbon fiber in subsea vehicles is really the right substance to use. It's three times better on a strength to buoyancy basis than titanium, the next best thing. So everyone wants to use titanium, but it's not strength to weight that you care about, strength to buoyancy. So our hull is gonna be positively buoyant, which is what you want in a submersible. Um, if you look at those other subs, they're all big and fat, and that's because they have all the syntactic foam because they're too heavy. Um, if you're light, it's a lot easier to add lead than it is to add foam. On paper, I would agree with him. In my carbon fiber cylinders video, I mentioned the one-third scale holes in passing. I'll go into just a little more detail about them here. In 2016-2017, Rush was partnered with Spencer Composites. In fact, they went on to manufacture the 2017 hull, which had to be scrapped because it was not behaving predictably. Anyway, Rush was testing the idea of having a 100% carbon fiber hull, the domes on each end included. The testing of these one-third scale holes was done at APLUW, and it was found that the carbon fiber domes just couldn't handle any kind of openings in them. They would fail in pressures over 4,000 PSI, which is equivalent to about 28 100 meters in depth. That is why the Titan ended up with the three and a quarter inch thick titanium domes. Rush also used the facilities at APLUW to gather data. He intentionally imploded these one-third scale holes so he could hear what dying carbon fiber sounded like, at what pressures they would fail, and how they would fail. I do not know how many of these holes were tested, but it appears that it was maybe two to three of them, maybe more, but I don't know for sure. You can see one of these failed holes here. This is one of the domes which displays how the carbon fiber just shredded when the hole was breached, which happened at the opening in the dome. You can also see on the other side of the interface ring the carbon fiber failed there too. I suspect this is due to it being in a chamber not much larger than the hole being tested, as we could see in that APLUW video earlier. Note that the entire hole didn't just shatter into a million little pieces, nor did the dome. In this picture, which has some oddities I can't explain, you can see how the edge of the cylinder failed here too, and also how the interface ring failed in a similar manner to the debris recovered. Notice all the sensors inside of the hole. Regarding the real-time monitoring system, some of the principles by which that worked was based on the data that Rush gathered in the testing at APLUW and something called the Kaiser effect. The Kaiser effect is a phenomenon observed in geology and material science that describes a pattern of acoustic emission or seismicity in a body of rock or other material subjected to repeated cycles of mechanical stress. The Kaiser effect is named after Joseph Kaiser, who first studied this behavior in materials in the 1950s. He discovered the phenomenon when he was studying acoustic emission response of metals, finding that the materials retain a memory of previously applied stresses. Kaiser found that a stress metal sample is zero if the applied stress is less than the previously applied maximum stress. A similar effect was also found in rock samples deformed in the course of acoustic emission, particularly as a result of cyclic thermal loadings of carboniferous sandstone and mudstone samples. So we can see here that this is the principle which the real-time monitoring system was based on. The 12 acoustic sensors in the hole were always listening for any abnormalities and it was comparing it to the data gathered on previous dives. One of the three computers on board was dedicated to this system. A new hole after the first dive should make very little noise, and the 2017 hole just wasn't doing that. The 2020 hole performed exactly as predicted until suddenly it failed after 13 successful expeditions. Um, we made one hull. Uh, I took it to 4,000 meters, um, uh, and it made a lot of noise, which is a very sphincter-tightening experience. 
Um, we brought it back, and it wasn't getting quieter on the second dive. It should have been dramatically quieter. If you think about it, when you get to this uh, maximum pressure, it's a thing called the Kaiser effect. You get a lot of popping and crackling, and the next time you go to that pressure, you should have a lot less. All those weak fibers and voids have all been taken care of, and this hall wasn't doing it, so we scrapped it. My point here is that Rush didn't just make this stuff up. It was based on already established principles, and he simply applied it to the carbon fiber. Was it the right move? It's hard to say. Carbon fiber can behave unpredictably when in compression, and that's all that I know for sure. So was cost the driving factor here? No. It was strength to buoyancy. Carbon fiber would seem to fit that bill. I hope that you found this video interesting and informative. I thank you for watching. Please leave comments and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.